Ever thought whether crypto is a security or commodity? What about property? Or is it all currencies? The thing is, we don't entirely know at the moment. Crypto is evolving at light speed every day, and there's a new asset that doesn't entirely fit into the current predefined asset classes. In this video, we'll break down the different types of cryptos to better understand how to classify them. Knowing how they behave and how they appreciate in value will mean you can make investment decisions with more conviction. But before we jump in, I see that 86% of you are unsubscribed. If you like what I do and want to see more regular content from me, hit the subscribe button. It really goes a long way for the channel and it only takes you a second. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the video. Standard disclaimer, the content in this video is for educational purposes only. This is not financial advice and please, please do your own research and consult a professional before looking to make any investment. Oh, and by the way, guys, I'm trying a new way of creating videos just for this video. Usually I type everything out and then just basically record it. Uh, but with this video, I am just recording from just me just talking. So yeah, let me know if there's any drop in quality. And uh, yeah, the main purpose is basically to create these videos more regularly. So without me writing, it saves a lot of time. And uh, hopefully you can watch these videos more often. Now, let me start by saying again, crypto assets are assets that are evolving every day. Nobody has clear answers on how to exactly classify crypto. Are they all securities? Is it a new type of commodity? Or is it a completely new asset class? It's not entirely clear at the moment, but over its few years of existence now, there seems to be a few different types of cryptos emerging within crypto itself. I will take you through how I think about it. So don't take this as gospel. I am just sharing with you how I think about it. Also, bear in mind, these are not strict characteristics. In fact, each crypto shares multiple characteristics between types. So one crypto may fall into multiple types and arguably, Every crypto can be considered a security as every crypto can be staked to earn yield. Anyway, so what I'm saying is it's not 100% clear and each needs to be evaluated individually. And just to make this clear, I am not saying which cryptos are securities, which cryptos are commodities, which cryptos are currencies. I am just classifying the types of cryptos within crypto and how I think about it. So I'm not saying which is a currency, which is a commodity, which is a security. I'm saying within crypto, there are different types of cryptos used for different purposes. And I'm saying what those types are. Okay, so this is how I think about it. You can basically break down crypto into seven main types. Currency, utility, governance, NFTs, which are a whole nother universe in itself. Social slash incentives. SDOs, which are security tokens, and then LPs, which are liquidity provider tokens. So these are the seven types I think there are. Uh, as I say, each crypto can fit into multiple, but the cryptos which I say fit into these types, their main purpose is for that type. So I will just briefly go into each of them. I will try to define them. And then I will also say how it appreciates in value. And if we know how it appreciates in value, then we can possibly compare it to some sort of uh, valuation method that we use today, for example, discounted cash flow. And I'm not saying this is the be all end all. I'm just saying this exercise will help us understand things a little bit better, right? Okay, so for the first one, it's currency. So currencies are mainly used as a medium of exchange. So moving value from point A to B, from Alice to Bob, as securely and efficiently as possible. So with currency, how I think about it is you can use the equation of exchange formula. Uh, this is a formula created by some uh, kind of this old, um, I guess this English economist, I guess, uh, way back when. And basically what it's saying is the supply of money is equal to the average price of goods times the number of transactions 
divided by the velocity. And the velocity is how many times money exchanges hands. So how many times, let's say, just think about it like you're in a market, like in a real physical food market. How many times does money exchange hands between all the sellers and buyers in the market, right? So this is what this uh, equation is saying. And basically, we're looking for the supply or the M to go down. Because when the supply goes down, then the value of the currency goes up, right? So actually, let me let me just change this to something more, more uh, easier to look at. Okay, so maybe this is a bit easier. So S is the supply. R is the rate of exchange or velocity. And then P is the price. T is the number of transactions. Okay. So what I'm saying with this, how a currency appreciates in value is the greater the liquidity, the greater the value. So what I mean is if we just look at the R for a moment and we get rid of everything else and we turn that into something that you can picture in your mind, like exchanging of cash. So basically, the more people that accept that currency, the more places you can use that currency, the more likely that people are to hold that currency because they know they can use it at another place at a later date and time. The more it exchanges hands uh, means basically the supply goes down. So so this is this is how I think about liquidity, all right? So, you know, I'm not an economist, so don't, uh, don't attack me. Uh, but this is how I think about it. So the easier it is to get in and out of that currency, the greater the value it is because you know you can pay someone, that person will accept it, that person can pay another person, that person will accept it, another person will pay that person, and that person. so yeah, it just, that's what I mean by liquidity, all right? So what I'm saying here is because of its liquidity, more people exchange it, so velocity goes up, which means the supply goes down. So that's what I'm saying here, all right? So, we're, okay, and uh, one more thing, when the supply goes down, just remember the price goes up, right? Okay, so when we look at the transactions, on the top of the equation, what this is saying is when the transactions goes down, the supply also goes down. But that doesn't sound right, right? But when you think about it, it actually is correct because if a currency is more valuable, you need less transactions to buy the same amount of stuff, right? So, okay, so let me let me change this to something that you can imagine. So you see here, the amount of stuff you can buy goes up, which means you need less transactions to buy the same amount of stuff. So if the amount of stuff, the amount of goods and services that you can buy with that currency goes up, then the supply also goes down. And if supply goes down, then the value goes up. So this is how I think about currency. As I say again, I'm not an economist, <laughs> but this is how I think about it. If you guys think I should change anything or you know, if you can improve this or make this clearer, please let me know. I am always trying to learn and uh, improve my way of thinking about things. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so these are the uh, examples of different currencies. This, these aren't all the currencies. I'm just saying these are some examples. So Bitcoin, you know, XRP, USDC, XLM, Stellar, uh, and XTC. So yeah, all these, their main purposes are as currencies, right? If you take uh, XRP again, its main product uh, developed by Ripple being used at the moment is ODL, which is on-demand liquidity, right? So this is what I'm saying. The greater the liquidity, the greater the value, right? So yeah. So how, how I would think about it is how many users accept it as payment? And uh, what I'm saying is not investors, users of the currency. So people actually using it for its intended use case, right? So the more people that accept it as payment, you know, that means we're onto something. That means liquidity is greater, right? And then how confident are they in holding it long term? If they're not confident in holding long term, then maybe, I don't know, maybe it's not as secure or maybe they don't see they don't they don't see it as something they can exchange at a later date, which means liquidity is poor, right? And then also, how do users use it in the real world? Okay, it needs to be used in the real world by real people. I'm not just saying like us degenerates investing in something, keeping it. I'm talking about real people using it. Okay, so the next type is utility. So utility to tokens or utility coins. Uh, so these are mainly used to access useful services by the, vari the various 
networks, right? The various protocols. So this token, when you use it, it unlocks some kind of useful service that you want, okay? And what I'm saying for this is the greater the demand for that particular use or use case, the greater the value of that utility token. So this is this is pretty simple. So, you know, if you can think of it like, you know, something that people want, right? Like, I guess, water or housing or the internet or, you know, whatever it is, um, the greater the demand for that thing, the higher the value for that particular token, okay? So when people want it, demand goes up, supply goes down, the price goes up, okay? That's pretty simple, I think, that one. Here are some examples of utility tokens. Chainlink, The Graph, uh, Quant, Filecoin, VXV. These are all utility tokens. So how I think about it is, you know, you want to think about how painful is the problem they're solving. How desperate does their users want to solve that particular problem? And how efficiently does it solve this problem? If it's not efficient, if it solves it in a way that is doesn't make sense, then, you know, it's probably not the best thing to use. And then also, once you understand this, how big is the market? How many users need this? The bigger the market, you know, the better, right? Uh, and then also, who are we competing with? How many competitors does, I don't know, let's say Quant have, right? Um, and oh, and by the way, if you guys hear some weird stuff going on in my background, I've got a washing machine on. I can't uh, get rid of that sound, unfortunately. And uh, yeah, my room is not entirely soundproofed at the moment. So you might hear some weird stuff going on in the background. But yeah, let's move on. The next type is governance. So what the heck is governance? Governance is, I guess you could say, the ability to govern something. Uh, so by holding that particular token, that governance token, it means you have ownership over that network. You have permission to vote on proposals to change the network in how you see fit. So, you know, let's take ICON, for example. ICON, there's something called a contribution proposal system. If you are a delegated member and hold a lot of ICX, you can uh, propose various things to change the network. And for that change to go through, holders of ICX can vote for that change. So you could say ICX is kind of like a governance token, but I have not put it into this type because as I say, each token can fit into multiple types. But what we're looking at here is the main type or the main purpose of that token. Okay, so how I think about governance is it's pretty similar to utility, uh, but the greater the demand for that network, the greater the value of that governance token. So, you know, you can think about it as, you know, the more lives, the more people that are affected by that network, that rely on that network, the higher the value of being able to govern that network, right? So this is how I think about it. Let's go to examples. So here are a couple examples. These, you know, they all do various different things. Uh, you know, they're not strictly governance tokens, but they allow you to govern that network. So for example, Polkadot, the DOT token, users of DOT can use a DOT to vote for various new parachains to be, to be, I guess, run on the Polkadot ecosystem. Okay. So Polkadot, Uniswap, Aave, uh, you know, they can all be, I guess you can say that they're mainly used as governance tokens. Uh, and then also DAOs. DAOs are really interesting. Uh, we have here a Flamingo DAO, which is like a fashion DAO. We've got Yield Guild Games. They recently released their uh, guild as a DAO token. And then we also have Constitution DAO, which was a DAO that actually attempted to buy a piece of the US Constitution. Uh, now, if you're wondering what DAOs are, uh, they're basically decentralized autonomous organizations. So if you think of, I guess if you, the most similar thing is a company. So, you know, when you start a company, there's a hierarchy of, I guess, you know, your boss, managers, employees. Uh, DAOs is a new way of organizing people where the, uh, I guess, I wouldn't say the uh, the hierarchy, but I would say you know the more tokens, the more more the more DAO tokens you hold, 
I guess, the more weight your say or your vote has within that DAO. So it's just a new way of organizing people. Um, so, yeah. So how I think about it is how many users does that network have? How efficiently does it serve its purpose? How well is it run? And then what's the quality of users? What what kind of people are in that DAO? Um, if there's If it's a DAO with... You know, all high net worth individuals who are trying to do something extremely, I guess, large in scale, then you could arguably, be, you could arguably say that uh, there's a greater value on that DAO. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so the next type is non fungible tokens, NFTs. Uh, this is something I'm pretty sure every single person on earth who has an internet connection knows about now. Um, so this is an entirely different universe. So within NFTs, there's, there, there are multiple different NFTs within NFTs itself. Uh, you know, the reason being is that virtually anything can be tokenized into an NFT. So, so NFTs in itself is basically an umbrella term for multiple different things. So let me go through a few examples here. So, you know, the, the most, I guess the most obvious one is, is music and, uh, art, right? So you see like various artists now are selling NFTs for a lot of money. You know, anything, any creative sort of work can be basically turned into an NFT. Even menus, recipes, uh, specific seats within a restaurant, they can all be combined into an NFT or even fashion. Let's say a particular piece of clothing can come with an NFT attached to it um, or maybe I don't know some metaverse sort of clothing is basically an NFT uh, so yeah they all come in various forms um, but not only that you can extend it even further so let's look at fashion again for example so if we look at a fashion house let's say I don't know let's take uh, Gucci for example so the design process the people involved within that design that department that entire department can become an nft so or you could you could say each employee in itself can become an nft or the design rights over a particular style can become an nft or even let's say the community comes up with their own design you know that can become an nft which feeds into gucci so you see that, you know, this NFTs is, is entirely different universe, right? So again, moving on, you can, you can even say properties, you can even say, uh, turn properties into NFTs. Or what about C containers? Each C container is an NFT. Imagine that each C container fractionalized, traded on the market. How valuable are C containers right now? And then also you can take it into gaming development. There's this whole idea within game development uh, at the moment. Um, you know, obviously, play to earn is one thing, uh, but I think it extends much further than that. So you know, the <sighs> games companies are now they're, they're coming to, uh, under a lot of criticism by their own players, right? The reason being is because <sighs> the way they monetize games at the moment sometimes takes away from the user experience. It puts a bad taste in the user's experience of that game. So with NFTs, there's a new way, a new monetization model for games companies. You could say that one area of the game would be tokenized and that would be turned into an NFT where the elements, the visual elements, the story, the gameplay within that area within the game is created by the community. So whoever owns that NFT they have exclusive ownership over that area within the game. So you see this, you know, NFTs is, is a whole nother universe. It unlocks various different things. We, we I think we barely even scratched the surface. You know, art, music, it's cool. You know, especially with music, it helps out the singers, the artists. Um, but, you know, this is the very tip of the iceberg, I think. Okay, so let's move on to the next type, which is social slash incentives. So these tokens, their main purpose is to incentivize users to do something. Okay, so 
I don't know, let, let's think about it as, let's say, you know those cards when you, you go to, I don't know, you go to Chipotle and they give you like a little stamp card. That little stamp card is an in- <laughs> a social in- uh, incentive token because it's getting you to come back to spend more money at Chipotle, right? That little piece of paper, you know, you get stamped on it and then after 10 stamps or something, you get an extra burrito. That thing, that, that little piece of paper is an incentive token. So what I'm saying for this is the greater the effectiveness of that incentive, the greater the value. Okay, so here are some examples. So BNB, which is the, uh, I guess, the token of the Binance exchange. So how it's incentivizing people is, you know, the, if you accept, uh, I guess, payouts in Binance, you get a higher payout, you get a higher percentage. Or if you hold a certain amount of Binance, you unlock different levels or tiers of service within Binance. Uh, and then the next one is Nexo. So if you accept payouts in Nexo, Nexo, by the way, is a, I guess you could call it a centralized borrow and lend, borrow, borrowing and lending platform. Uh, but if you accept payouts in Nexo, they pay you an extra 2% higher, right? So you, you want to hold Nexo, right? Uh, and then the next one is BAT, basic attention token. So you can think of this as kind of incentivizing you to use the bra- uh, the Brave browser, okay? So, you know, when you use the Brave browser, you get paid in BAT because you don't get to see ads because the, the advertisers pay you directly with BAT. So it's kind of incentivizing you to use the Brave browser because you get paid in BAT and you also don't see uh, as much ads, right? And then energy web token is the next one. So energy web token, if you hold a certain amount, I believe you're able to do different different things on a network. You're able to contribute different amounts to the network or receive different amounts of uh, energy, right? So yeah, so with this one, I would say you have to think about what does it get people to do? How beneficial is that behavior? And how effective is it in getting those people to do that particular thing? Because the more effective it is, the more valuable it is, right? Let's say I, I only put like, I don't know, I'll give you an example. Like I put, I don't know, I, I put like a cookie on the floor in the middle of a room full of kids. You know, let's say three kids run to the middle of the room to get that cookie. Okay, great. Okay, let's say I put a, a, a birthday cake in the middle of the room. Let's say six kids. Six out of 10 kids go grab that cake. Then let's say, I don't know, I put like 50 bucks in the middle of the room. All the kids go and take the 50 bucks. So, so that's what I mean by ex- effective. So the more effective that incentive, the better it is, right? Okay, so the next type is security tokens. Uh, so you can just think of security tokens as essentially securities which have been tokenized. <laughs> doesn't get simpler than that. Um, so these are just, I guess you could say just normal securities, but they've been tokenized and can interact with the entire DeFi, uh, you know, all the various financial crypto products out there. Um, so the, these aren't security tokens that I'm showing you here, but these are a list of the different platforms used to issue security tokens. So for one, Algorand. Algorand is being used by Securitize uh, to create sec- uh, security tokens. The next one is Polymath. Polymath is an ERC20 token. They're doing the same thing. And then also Ethereum and Polygon, they're, you know, they're used by various security token issuers to create uh, STOs. So how I think about it is, you know, how easy is it for the normal banks to use them? Do they have good relations with the regulators? How well are they connected? Uh, and are they niche? Do they only create very specific security tokens or do they compete on low cost? So, you know, it attracts bankers with lower uh, fees. Okay, so I can't really, you know, this is this again goes into a different universe of stuff, uh, but these are the different networks used to issue security tokens. Okay, so yeah, let's move on. Okay, the last type is liquidity provider tokens so this is something i don't think many people uh, i mean i guess only a handful of people have done i'm assuming most of you haven't done but essentially 
you can go to a decentralized exchange or automated market maker and basically provide the tokens you hold to create the market. So let's say you want to trade, you go to, okay, let's say you go to Uniswap, you want to trade uh, USDC and Ethereum. You can provide both USDC and Ethereum in a specified ratio, which they specify. Once you provide both within that specified ratio, out pops a liquidity provider token. Let's call it USDC ETH. And then once uh, you do that, you hold that token, that liquidity provider token. Each transaction done within that USDC ETH market collects fees, right? So those fees, a proportion of those fees, depending on how much liquidity you provided, depending on how uh, deep the liquidity uh, of that market is, you get a proportion of those fees. So it's constantly generating you yield, basically. Yeah, so this this goes into more of the DeFi space, you know, a lot of all those degenerates, they, you know, there's all different types of ways of providing liquidity, using that liquidity to do other things. Uh, you know, there's a whole, this is also, it, get, it gets quite deep into this space, okay? So, so yeah, so the value depends on the depth of liquidity of the market. So the less depth it is, the more proportion of the rewards you get by providing liquidity to that particular market. And then also how much liquidity you provide it in the end. Uh, but then there's also more risk because uh, there's less volume of trades of that market. So you can think about it as, you know, getting 50% of 10 trades or getting 5% of 1 million trades. Which one is, is better, right? So you can think of it like that. Um, so yeah, so that I, I won't go too deep into this. This one is quite, uh, I mean, from even for me, to be honest, um, I'm not really a, a trading type person. I'm more of a fundamental, just understanding things, breaking things down type of person. So yeah, I'll leave it at that and let's move on. Okay, so that was the end of the video. I'll leave you guys with a takeaway. These are different types broken down. And then also these are the different types of markets that I see within crypto. These are the, I guess you could say the main areas of play within crypto. So L1, L2, L1s are, uh, you know, the Ethereum's, the Algorand's, the Solana's. L2s are the Arbitrum's, the Optimism's, the, uh, I can't think of any more, but yeah, those are L1, L2s. They're having their own little game, their own little fight within that market. Then, of course, there's a whole DeFi, CeFi space. That's a huge space. NFTs, collectibles, that's another huge space. And then out pop from that gaming and metaverse, which is an up and coming space, but is growing very fast already. And then there's all the, you know, kind of the boring stuff like supply chain and uh, interoperability. And then there's, there's also another one, Web3, um, but I, I don't know too much about that. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about the whole Web3 movement at the moment. But uh, there you go. Those are the, I guess, you see how I, I see the market broken down. So yeah, so that's the end of the video. Tell me if you guys liked me just talking to you without uh, being so um, organized about it. I think this video might be a little bit longer than usual. So yeah, so anyway, so if you enjoyed the video, of course, hit the like button and subscribe. I try to make videos like this every week. Yeah, hit the like button and subscribe if you want to see me next week. And uh, yeah, that was fun. It was new for me doing this, um, but hopefully I will be making much, 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 much more videos for you guys uh, in the foreseeable future. So thanks again, and I will see you next week.